welcome to our first preview show in three months. It's great to be back and BBC Radio Silence Chris Temple is virtually alongside me as we look forward to Premier League football returning to Vitality Stadium this weekend. Here's what's coming up. We discuss Project Restart and what lies ahead for the Cherries. Aaron Ramsdale joins us and sheds light on his coronavirus experience. And finally, we look ahead to the weekend as Crystal Palace visit Vitality Stadium. Well, plenty coming up today, but before we go into that, Chris, it's it's great to be back, isn't it? It is good to be back. Uh, it's obviously good to see your face first and foremost. So I haven't seen you for a while well, since uh, since it all wound down, really. So yeah, it's great to, to get it all in motion. It's great that we've, we've seen a couple of games now as well, just to get a flavour of what it's going to be like. Um, you know, mixed mix reviews in terms of a lot of the things that have happened in the first couple of games we've seen. Obviously, Friday night will be the next couple to, to sort of look at before everything gets going for the Cherries on Saturday. Oh, as you say, football returns for us on Saturday. I was actually going to ask you what you made of those two games that we've seen so far, the two more games happening on Friday. And, you know, it, we had our first taste of it. It was certainly very surreal, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I, I was watching without crowd noise. I know that was quite a sort of, lots of people were messaging my WhatsApp groups were going backwards and forwards with, are you watching with or without crowd noise? I was watching without. And the reason I was, was because that's the environment I'll be in commentating uh, on the Bournemouth games. We will be in the stadium for BBC Radio Solent and obviously AFCB TV uh, through the website as well. So for me, I'm going to be commentating in silence. So effectively, I didn't want that canned noise. I wanted to hear what it was genuinely going to be like. I did uh, flick over to the, the crowd noise selection I didn't like it. Um, it was it just didn't even feel realistic remotely. It just seemed like someone had just put a CD on in the background. I know they're trying hard with the U's and the R's or whatever, but the crowd doesn't stay the same volume for the whole way through. Um, I know some people enjoyed it, and actually I saw a survey that said two thirds of people preferred it. Um, it wasn't for me, um, but yeah, in terms of um, other things that happened in the game, I mean, everyone's going to have talked to death about the goal line technology. Um, failure, which my only sort of thing I, I would add on that is that I think the linesman's got to get involved. Um, he's got the best view. He was banging line. Yes, I know they don't like to overrule technology and the technology's there for a reason, but I think the linesman in that situation has got to get his flag up or at least talk on the comms to the ref and say, that looks very close. That might be worth checking. Um, so that's my observation really from that, that fiasco. It wasn't a great game for Sheffield United, was it? Um, and actually, to be honest, thank goodness Villa didn't go on and win it after that clanger because that would have really, you know, booted the cherries where it hurts, if you like. Um, so I guess anything that kept Villa below Bournemouth was, was good. And now it's a level playing field, if you like. Everyone's played the same number of games. And then City against Arsenal. I mean, David Luiz had a nightmare. City looked, looked pretty good. Um, and I think that'll be a, you know, that's going to be a tough game, as we know it would be when Bournemouth eventually go there. So lots of little bits. I'm sure the players are watching on with interest at quite a few of the protocols. I wasn't sure how, much, how good the social distancing was and a lot of the protocols that have been put in place about celebrations and handshakes and all that sort of other stuff because there was quite a bit going on. But again, I think that's, it's only natural. People have done the same thing for years and years and put yourself back in that environment. It's like any environment. You are going to take, take a bit of time to get used to change. So I think as you know, there'll be a little word in the ear of a few people to say, just watch the handshakes, just watch the hugging when you score. Chris Wilder and you know, was hugging people at the end. So I think the, uh, the sort of the, the upper bodies will be looking down to say, just be careful of that, be careful of that. And from a Bournemouth perspective, nine games to go, you know, all to play for. Do you think the break came at a good time for Eddie Howe and his squad? Two ways to look at it. Um, yes, in terms of injuries, because of course we know how thin the squad's been this season. And any, if, you, if you said, right, you can have David Brooks, Arnott, Dan Juma, Lloyd Kelly, uh, Steve Cook, you know, just to name the few off the top of my head, you can have all of them back for the last nine games. Of course, you'd say, yes, please. Um, the, the downside is that actually Bournemouth were just picking up a bit of momentum. Um, I just found a little bit of a formula, albeit they were sort of forced into it with the personnel they had. They switched to the 4-3-3. Um, let's not forget, last time out at Liverpool, feels like an eternity ago, but for James Milner scooping that one off the line from Ryan Fraser, Bournemouth could well have got a point at Liverpool. Um, obviously, you know, the draw with Chelsea, um, you know, good, good performances in other games as well. So I thought from a, for a sort of a, a momentum of the season point of view, it probably came at a bad time. But from a fitness point of view of the players, um, yeah. And of course, the other, the other side of it is that now, uh, presumably, Ryan Fraser won't be involved. So again, you sort of, you, you're bringing back a few, but you're losing a good player as well. So um, probably 50-50, did it come at a good time? Yes and no, which is not really helping you, is it? <laughs> 
Well, we mentioned, well, you mentioned several names there, Steve Cook, Chris Mepper, Marnat Dunjima, David Brooks, all these players, they've been pitched in training since, you know, the lads were back and even for Eddie Howe and the rest of the boys to have them back in training, what a massive boost. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, you look at the squad now and I've just written down sort of on a bit of paper there, the positional sort of uh, challenges for each each position. You look at the defenders now, suddenly you've got Kelly, Mepo and Francis back fit, Steve Cook back fit to add into the Isles of Ake and Stacey and Smith and Rico and Jack Simpson, of course. So there's a lot of uh, options all of a sudden there. Um, you throw, you know, the midfield five, to be fair, essentially have been pretty consistent all season in terms of they've all been relatively fit. I think Phil Billing is the only one who's picked up a bit of a problem in, in this sort of mini pre-season, if you like. But I think the, the wide positions and the attacking positions are where it's going to be really interesting. What shape Eddie goes with. Um, he's obviously got to accommodate, if he's fit, the likes of David Brooks. Um, I know he missed a a couple of sessions, I think, but he, he seems to be back amongst it, which is good. Dan Juma, obviously Harry Wilson's been occupying the wide positions. Is there an argument? And I've been arguing this for a lot of the season that he should play as a number 10 and play more centrally. Do, does the sort of presence back in the squad of Brooks and Dan Juma allow you to shove Harry Wilson in field? Does Brooks play more centrally as he's done before? We imagine Fraser won't be involved, so therefore that's there's sort of another wing slot opening up, if you like. So, And then obviously, where do you fit King in if you're playing Harry Wilson as a 10? Um, Solanke, Callum Wilson, obviously, you know, will be in as a nine. So I think the attacking part of the field, um, I think the back four will probably pick itself. Um, I think it will probably be the, the back four that you'd pick. So probably Stacey, Ake, Steve Smith. Um, and Smith at left back, I would think, because that's the way they went when they had those guys fit pre, um, pre the lockdown. Um, but yeah, I'm fascinated by how it's going to line up attacking-wise. And you talked about Harry Wilson there, obviously signing a contract and extension. You've got, you know, the other four that have, signed theirs you know until the end of the season and we'll wait and see what happens until then but for them to have that all tied up and they can just focus on the nine games ahead that would be again another added bonus yeah it's, it's a decision that you know probably no footballers will never have to make again and haven't had to make before is do I agree a contract extension for nine games when I thought my my time either was winding down or I'm not sure where my future lay I think obviously the four guys you have signed are all in you know completely different uh, parts of their career than than Ryan Fraser, for example, who hasn't signed. Um, so, yeah, I think the future for them is, I, obviously, they will have had talks behind the scenes. I'm not party to those talks at all. Charlie Daniels has got the toughest job because he hasn't been fit for a year, and the best part, you know, really. Um, so, do they give him a chance to, to sort of have another year and to get himself back involved now that they've got Rico, now they've got Lloyd Kelly fit, now they've got Smith that can play left back as well with Stacey doing so well at right back. So, I think Charlie Daniels has got a, a tough job on. Um, Andrew Sermon obviously slid down to sort of four, um, fifth central midfielder now behind the other four. Um, you have two for each position. So does Andrew Sermon become surplus to requirements? I don't know. There's, there's some difficult decisions. Simon Francis is your club captain. Um, does he add in the, you know, Steve Fletcher would, would keep getting contracts a year, a year here and there because of what he brings as well as his, his football, what he brings to the place and his experience. So Simon Francis has probably got that on his side. Um, so yeah, there's, and Arthur Boric, of course, seems to be getting fitter and fitter, even though he's about 84. So there's, you know, there are decisions to be made there. I'm not sure all four will, will still be here next season. I'd like it if they would, because they're all great lads and they've all been a part of the journey for a long time. Um, and they, you know, they really have contributed uh, a number of, you know, key key roles, if you like, down the years. Um, but of course, romance is one thing, and you know the part people play. Just look at Mark Pugh, for example, even Ryan Fraser to a certain extent. Although that's a relationship that's gone a bit sour. But um, yeah, it's um, it's it's difficult times for them, and I'm not sure how much will have been decided already um, because they don't know what division they're going to be in. And just finally, here, when you look at the running as a whole, what do you make of it? I mean, there's certainly some very tough games in there, but there's also games where you'd be looking at, at getting some points from. Yeah, I mean, I've actually, I've actually sort of, uh, I've had plenty of time on my hands, as you have as well, Zoe. So I've had time to divide the nine games up into sort of uh, three sections, if you like. I've, I've got um, two marks next to the ones where I think they're absolutely must wins. Uh, and two of those are in the first three games, Palace and Newcastle at home, I think uh, have got to be must wins. I think six points from the first three games is a minimum, um, really. Uh, Wolves away, I've got one mark next to as a sort of, it would be nice to get something there, you know, ma- possibly a point but it's certainly not a must win Wolves are chasing the Champions League of course so that's going to be tough but again not to you know not to underestimate the fact that some of these places that are hard to go to without crowds they're not going to be quite as as hard to go to 
still good football as you're playing on the pitch, of course. Um, and then you look down at you know, Man, Man United away, Man City away. You, you're putting them down as blanks to say if you get anything there, brilliant. But that's not where you're gonna. That's not where you're gonna stay up. Um, Tottenham at home and Leicester at home. Again, the fact they're at home. Um, the only problem with those games is they do come when everyone's probably clicked into their stride a little bit. Um, and then, of course, Southampton at home and Everton away to finish with. Um, you know, Southampton at home, I've got that down as a must win. And you wouldn't want to be going to Everton on the last day having to get too much, um, let's face it, although they might well be in mid-table and, and sort of drifting. Um, I think the key to, key to it all, and as we saw a bit in the opening games on Wednesday night, is who's going to be the least rusty. Um, out of all the teams because people are going to be rusty and I'm not sure it's a huge advantage for Bournemouth to have big games straight up um, they've got no time to ease into all this new surroundings and everything they've got to get straight at it I know that he's clever he's been having them training under lights and sort of re-enacting um, re, uh, if you like the way things are going to be um, but they've got to beat Palace and they've got to beat Newcastle at home and something the Wolves would be lovely so there's no messing around here they can't blame anything for um, you know, oh, it took us a while to get going, we're not fit enough, blah, blah, blah. That may well all be the case, but we still got to get results. Absolutely. Well, we are just one day away from that Premier League return and someone who's been enjoying a brilliant season between the sticks is Aaron Ramsdale. Let's take a look at his best bits. Big day for that young man, Aaron Ramsdale. Ball pay with the shot. Oh, what a save again for the high flying Aaron Ramsdale. New shots. Top save again from Ramsdale. And Joe Alenta could love the keeper here. Ramsdale did so well. It's Mate Vidra. Terrific save from Ramsdale. The Delion just comes out, throws himself at it. That's a terrific save. Mason Mount and deflected and brilliantly saved by Ramsdale. Mount finds the gap. Oh, his saves are getting better and better. Calvin Lewin will give chase. Ramsdale is out quickly enough. By Daniels, but he sets up again. Ramsdale. And Anderson, and it's a terrific save from Aaron Ramsdale. Is this the moment? Ramsdale save. Well, that was the best of Aaron Ramsdale this season. And we are delighted to say that Rambo has dropped in on our preview show this week. Rambo, thank you for joining us. I'm sure the first question on everyone's mind is, how are you doing and how are you feeling? Thanks for having me, first of all. Um, yeah, I'm fine. Um, obviously, what went on was um, a strange time, but luckily I wasn't affected affected by it. So, um, the time in isolation was reasonably okay. Um, and now, yeah, back, back to normal. I've been for a few weeks, so get that routine in and, and be back with the lads was... It was great fun and, and now we look forward to the next few weeks. And um, sort of for you preparing to come back to training, I know you were up north and then you came back down south, preparing to come back, it's all starting to come together and then you get told you have to isolate for seven days. What was that like for you mentally? Yeah, it was, um, it was tough. Um, being back at, in Stoke was, um, was great. I got to, to be with my family. Um, I haven't been there that long since I was in school, so it's been a good five or six years. And they were helping me with my fitness and stuff like that. And knowing that I was there for the whole of lockdown and um, I was fine, I was negative with my tests and things, that was a huge relief mentally. That obviously I didn't pick it up when I was in, in Stoke with my family, and obviously they were okay because my previous test was negative and that was the last time I saw them so um that was one sort of side of it and um other than that it was just sort of shock and, and confused I was confused just because you hear of some of the stories in the news and obviously it sort of gets blown out of proportion or the ones which get reported on are the, are the severe cases 
Um, and then I just weren't feeling anything. I was feeling fine. I felt felt good. I was in training that, that weekend. And then obviously just staying at home, not allowed to to do anything just in case something happens or something flares up. And just it was just almost like a week would be obviously taken away from me where I could have been a week ahead of, of where I should have been. So um, after the first few days, I got my head around it. I was fine. And now you're back in training. How nice has that been? And, you know, how nice has it been not to do it remotely as such? Yeah, it's been it's been great to see the lads training with the lads. Um, obviously, with social distancing, it's been it's been hard. Like you want to just go and sit next to your mates and and have a good chat. And obviously, we're always made aware, and and we all know as um, from seeing things and and knowing the rules that we have to be a uh, distance. But just being back and just being having that sort of competitive edge and. And seeing the lads with the sp- and getting the spirit back in with the team, it's just been fantastic. And hopefully we can take some of some of that into the last few games. And I know you said before about how tight all you goalkeepers are. It must have been great to get back and see those familiar faces. Yeah, it definitely was. Um, I would say with us three young lads, and then um, just loads of energy and then Arthur came back and he was he was, he was like he was 20 again um, scoring celebrating making saves and it's just you, people must look over at us and just think obviously everyone thinks we're crazy and weird but they must, just must think we're just having a great time and, and we are we're working hard and um, it's just great to see them um, them free when things go well and big smiles on all of our faces um, it just brings back good memories of obviously when you first start the game or just something which happened, I don't know, in the season. Um, and it's just been great fun being back with them and diving about and, and getting stuck in. And one thing that you've also done since being back is you went to go and visit young George on his birthday. Just tell us about that because we all saw how emotional he got, you know, when he'd not been very well during lockdown and, and received a phone call from you. Yeah, so his dad still sort of keeps in touch with us. Oh, I'll drop a message every now and then asking how he is. And um, he's still waiting for one of his test results, um, sort of any day now, really. Um, and it was his birthday and they were just sort of having a drive-by um, party. They were just in the front garden and it was like, it's almost like going to football. There's like designated spot, spots for people to park the cars on the other side of the road and just went over and sort of showed my face. Um, obviously, gave him a pair of gloves, and it was just, it was just nice. He's he's doing well. He's fighting. Um, he's a lot healthier than what he was before. But we're just waiting for he's waiting for the results to see what needs to be done further down the line. But he's just buzzing that the the foot is coming back on, and he gets to watch. Um, he gets to watch not just us, but the whole league and. And I think everyone is the same. Just want that to be on TV. And I think everyone's counting down the days. Turning our attention to the weekend, Crystal Palace at home, first game back. How important is it to hit the ground running straight from there? Yeah, it's it's huge. Um, no one really knows what this is going to be like over the next nine games. No one's got a, an advantage. Everyone's at the same playing field. Um, so it's whoever goes into it with the with the best mindset, who's prepared the best. Um, so if if you can get a bit of momentum going, where in a, in a in a place which won't have any momentum because the the fans being taken away, it can be huge. And uh, getting off to a good start, not just in the game itself, but against Palace, hopefully getting three points. Everything you can just build so much momentum. Everything everything can roll into into the match on, on Wednesday but um, it's going to be a, a bizarre feeling playing behind closed doors isn't it yeah um, I think us younger lads might deal with it a bit better um, it's not been too long ago when I was playing under 23s football um, and you've got a handful of fans there or an international friendly for the under 18s 19s and you go into Slovenia or 
or somewhere like that and there's only a small number of their fans um so it's not something which is alien to to me and possibly some of the young lads um but i think if you if you go in with the right mindset that and and not thinking about oh it's an empty stadium it feels like training then um we'll have no problems but it's definitely be strange in some ways obviously just warming up with no no fans celebrations things like that don't really know what I'm going to do when we score I don't really want to knee slide to to no one in the stand but I'll have to figure something out and just finally we all know how much the fans want to be there but it's it's so important to reiterate the message of staying at home and and staying away from the stadium yeah 100% um we all know the rules which have been put in place and um it'd be detrimental to the to to the rules and if obviously the fans came to the to the stadium to try and get pictures and signatures and obviously it'll be hard not going to see um the people obviously you adore and, and your support but if something were to happen to to one of the players and and that was through sort of people breaking rules and um Obviously, it would kill us as a team, and obviously the fan who fans who come obviously don't want that either. So um, I think the best way they can help us is just by obviously supporting the Hearts out at home, um, and when they do that, and when the time's right, then I'm sure we can all pour back in, uh, pile back into the to the stadium. But for now, I think. We all know the rules. We all just need to stick to them and then um, get through this period sort of together and, and wait for the outcome. Well, Rambo, thank you ever so much for your time. Thank you for joining us. It's, uh, it's great to see you back out on that pitch. And uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all the fans in wishing you the best of luck this weekend. Now, this weekend is where our attention is going to turn to next and that game against Crystal Palace. And earlier in the week, we spoke to Eddie Howe to gather his thoughts much from the team that we saw. Um, very experienced team, very well drilled, um, very good defensively this season and a real threat with the attacking players that they have. So uh, a, well, a very well balanced team. But very, very pleased now to be back to football and the results will define our future, not, um, not elsewhere. We don't have too many players that I can say are ruled out of this game. Uh, you know, are players 100% fit, i.e. David Brooks, are they 100%? fit to play 90 minutes. Well, we, may, we may have a few doubts on a couple of players, but as I say, the squad's the healthiest it's been. No one could have predicted what would have happened with the virus and the season shutting down and being extended. And Ryan's then found himself in a very difficult position um, because of that. Um, so yeah, not a surprise. He has now um, played his last game for the football club. He won't be involved with us for the last nine games. Uh, I only want to players who are, are fully focused on uh, the relegation battle that we have ahead um, and I'm looking forward to, to doing that with my squad. Well that was Eddie Howe looking ahead to this weekend's game. Now this is normally the bit Chris where we would go back and we look at Palace's recent form and we look at the players that are, are doing well for them but with a three-month gap it all seems a bit irrelevant doesn't it? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, Palace had just actually found their stride uh, before they got locked down. They've had a sort of slow start and a bit of an in-and-out season, really unspectacular season, but they find themselves with an outside chance of getting into Europe. Uh, and, of course, they're one of the teams now that can come back and have a right crack at this. And, you know, if they get into Europe, brilliant. If they don't, they're not going to go down. Um, so they've got a the, the proverbial free roll, if you like. They won the last three before before lockdown, all before all by a 1-0 scoreline. They don't score that many goals. I think Jordan Ayew is their top scorer um, with three, I think, if I'm right in saying, but they certainly don't score too many. But, you know, with Zahar and, and Townsend and obviously Jordan Ayew, Benteke, you know, dangerous player but can't score. Um, and, of course, the, the away game at Selhurst Park in uh, early December, a Tuesday night, Bournemouth played against 10 men for best part of, what, 70 minutes and, and lost 1-0 to a late goal. And I think Eddie called that his lowest moment in uh, as Bournemouth manager. And it was, I, I remember it well because I just landed back from New Zealand that morning. So I was sort of spaced out and jet-lagged all over the place. Couldn't believe what I was seeing. So, yeah, uh, that will be one that Bournemouth will look to be c correcting. Um, 
I don't forget this fixture, you know, has uh, at Bournemouth, it's been a good fixture down the years. David Brooks, of course, scored his first Premier League goal against Palace on a, on a Monday night. So maybe a bit of an omen if he's to come back into the team. Um, but, you know, Roy Hodgson is, uh, I think Palace fans think they've done a, you know, he's done a great job. They've steered him away from, away from trouble, um, managed to keep hold of their, their best players, added quite, you know, um, sensibly as well. The likes of Milivojevic, you know, in central midfield, a hardy campaigners and, you know, the hustle and bustle with Lerma in there will be interesting to see. So, yeah, it's, 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 not, a, it's not the worst game you could have. Um, it's probably quite a nice game in a way because, um, yeah, Palace are not going to be, yes, they're chasing Europe, but I don't, I don't think they're going to be all guns blazing like the teams down the bottom are. Um, when you look at the run-in, I mean, actually, Bournemouth are the only team out of the bottom six who don't play any of the other bottom six. So there are no six pointers in there in terms of huge swings. You know, if you suddenly lose to West Ham or something, there's a big swing in West Ham's favour. Um, but Bournemouth don't play any of those teams down the bottom. You look at West Ham, for example, play three of the bottom six in their last nine games. Norwich play three of them. Don't rule Norwich out, by the way. I want to throw that in there. I think they've got a chance of, if they can get, if they can get out of the traps, I think they have got a chance of, making something happen. They've got Southampton at home, obviously, and then Everton at home, their first two games. But in there, Brighton, Watford, West Ham, they've got some six-pointers in there against the teams down the bottom. So I'm going to throw them in there and say don't quite rule them out just yet. Well, funny enough, I was going to ask you, we've got Crystal Palace coming up this weekend. For Eddie Howe and his squad, is that quite a good game to have back? Because as you say, Palace, they're not scrapping at the bottom. They're not necessarily competing too much higher up the table. And back at home, and you know, live on a Saturday night, that's quite a good game for Eddie Howe, surely. Yeah, I mean, great great to be a sort of a, a herald a new era in terms of being the first Premier League game live on the BBC as well. And as I've mentioned, I think before uh, before we did this programme, before we uh, before the fixtures came out, I think it's, it's a great chance for people if they ever want to watch the TV and have the radio pictures, uh, the radio commentary from us on BBC Radio Solent synced up, and the fact that the game's on the BBC makes it a lot easier because anyone who tries to do it when it's on satellite will know there's all sorts of delays. But the BBC picture should be roughly in tune. So, although don't do that because then you'll spot my mistakes. Anyway, um, to answer your question, um, I think it is quite a, quite a good game. Um, yes, because Palace, as you say, they've got an outside chance. Um, nothing to lose for them, which is sometimes the games where, where Bournemouth uh, can express themselves although they don't like to have as much possession this season they've, they've been sort of sitting back and catching teams on the counter-attack so the wide open games haven't actually always um you know been as as, as Bournemouth performance as, as they have been in the past but yeah I think I think it's not a bad game um if you were sort of choosing somebody you'd want probably someone not I would say Burnley but not necessarily Burnley but someone who's maybe out of the out of the I mean Southampton wouldn't be a bad game if it wasn't a local game the fact that they're probably out of the relegation picture but not going to make Europe that would be the ideal game. Palace is probably in the next tier. And one thing we haven't mentioned is the additional substitutions that can be mm. used. For Bournemouth, obviously, we've talked about them having players coming back from injury. That could be a, a really useful tool, couldn't it? It could. Um, I think it advantages the bigger teams more. Um, we saw Man City the other night uh, make five subs and look who they brought on. You know, some unbelievable players. Aguero's coming on as the, what was he, the fourth sub or the fifth sub? Um, some fantastic players coming on. So those with deeper squads, those with better quality squads are going to feel the benefit of that. Um, it's great for, as you say, the guys who are coming back that they may well find themselves with some more match minutes. And again, the schedule, three more games have been announced in the last couple of days, of course. It's, it's mainly, you know, four or five day turnarounds. Uh, there's one seven day turnaround, I think, but mainly it's going to be pretty quick fire. Now, we know the games aren't as intense um, because of a number of external factors. You know, we, we know that the crowd makes a big difference and the fact that players are easing themselves back in. So the early games aren't as intense, but mentally they're still, you know, they are going to be intense mentally, if not physically. So I think we will see a little bit of rotation from Eddie. Um, but I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, though, but I think Bournemouth were one of the teams who voted against the um, five subs rule um, because I think they, they backed themselves to be fitter um, and obviously bearing in mind that they didn't know who they would have back as well. So um, I think it advantages the bigger teams, but it is a good chance for those guys who haven't played to get themselves on the field. And just finally, Aaron Ramsdale's just touched on it, but it is absolutely paramount, isn't it, that supporters stay at home, watch the game on their sofa and, and don't travel to the stadium. And there's absolutely nothing to gain by travelling to the stadium. You won't see anything. Um, you won't even see the team hardly coming you know, into the ground because there are all the pr protocols in place. Um, you know, Vitality Stadium is, is quite isolated in terms of the fact it's in Kings Park and there's a lot of space around. You won't be able to get near it. So there's absolutely no point. 
Um, and also, it's on BBC One. People are making it a good thing of you know Saturday nights as much as you can social distance, following the rules. You know, having friends on you know video conferencing or you know however many friends you're allowed to have round. If you've got a big garden and the weather's nice, then follow the rules and take your TV into the garden or something. Um, but absolutely, there's no point in coming to the stadium. Uh, there's nothing to see. There's no way you're you can support the team. Um, so I would say, yeah, make a, make an evening of it in front of the BBC. Absolutely. Well, that is all we have got time for today. As Chris has just said, please avoid any travel to the stadium on Saturday for your own safety and that of players and staff. Wherever you're watching, we hope you enjoy the game and we'll be back next week to preview the fixture at Wolves. Bye for now. Yay. Gribble and James. <laughs> all right, so I'll stop recording before I lose it. Hang on. Stop recording. All right, see you soon, boys. Okay.